Um, thank you all for coming. Um, today, uh, Catherine Emerson is visiting this week. She is a senior research scientist at CSIRO, which is the government lab in uh, national lab in Australia, and a near uh, her lab is near Melbourne in Aspendale. She got her PhD in 2002 in Lancaster with Rob McKenzie, and then did um, so a postdoc, research assistant, lecturer at York University with our friend Matt Evans, among <laughs> other people, and then um, was also a research fellow at Leeds, working with uh, Ken Carslaw and various, various people, people, and uh, is now has now been in Australia for several years, four years, mm -hmm. and um, so today she's going to tell us about um, Megan and biogenic emissions in Australia. So, yeah, thank you for letting me turn up. Um, um, because technology thwarts me a bit, what I'm going to do... Oh, hello. <laughs> is, um, <laughs> as always, um, show something a little bit backwards because uh, PowerPoint refused to, to operate. Um, so what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about air quality in Australia before... Just take my picture, otherwise it, you, know, you can't prove I was ever here. <laughs> um, so yeah, I forgot to get my picture taken when I went round the, the UK. Um, yeah, so talk a little bit about air quality in Australia and some of the challenges that we um, are seeing at the moment, and then I'll move on and talk about some of the fun I've been having um, coupling up the biogenic emissions model, Megan, into the CSIRO chemical transport model. Um, and you know the sort of fun and games we've had with Australian vegetation maps and plant functional types and um, just trying to get some ideas from, from you people as well about how I can sort of improve it and uh, how we can all sort of work together in, in the future. So first of all, Australian air quality. So I'm just looking at Louise in the back. Um, Australia is very, very much behind the rest of the, the Western world in that we have very few air quality monitoring stations in operation. We don't have a centralised um, place where you can look up ozone um, like you do over here. And we also do not have a national emissions inventory either. Um, so what we attempted to do was sort of try and get everyone together to try and sort of work out how we can do this. And one of the first things we showed them um, is this animation. Now this is based on the sort of NASA go-kart particulate um, animation. Um, we may have to turn off the, the lights a little bit. Um, so this is a, a period in Australia where there was a very large fire and it will stop in a minute and tell you what all the different colours are. So these are biogenics here. There's a lot of um, trees um, in the Blue Mountains area of Sydney. Can everyone see that or should we turn the lights out? Turn the lights out. It goes on for a while. Um, and so yellow is dust, um, the red is smoke, and you see there's a big fire here. Um, and what we were trying to prove to all the various states was that actually you can't just sort of look at your, your individual town alone. A lot of the fire and a lot of the smoke um, and the dust, particularly in Australia, um, goes into state, um, and there's a lot of it as well. Australia is a bit unusual in that its air quality problems are its own. We don't have any sort of effect from New Zealand. Um, to the north, we have Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, and every now and then we may get a bit of smoke, but really our, our air quality problems are our own. Um, and then this is the urban sources only. So this is um, just the <laughs> particulate matter. <laughs> you can see, it's like me. <laughs> um, it's just people live around the coast. This is Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. Adelaide is here and Perth and there's nothing going on in the top at all. So really a lot of the Australian air quality problems are of a natural um, basis. Of, I mean yes, local problems where people live are anthropogenic but you can't sort of hope to evaluate your, your air shed unless you look at these sort of big massive trans-state um, pollution <coughs> events. Right, enough of that. Um, let's move on with said presentation. So, okay, right. So I've already said that because I had to move uh, on slightly. So this is Australia. Um, these are the seven states 
um, and territories um, in Australia, and it's it's basically sort of divided into two. The resources are divided into two. So we have New South Wales <coughs> here, Melbourne here. They have all the resources, and then there is the rest of Australia. Um, generally the EPAs um, particularly in Perth and Adelaide I mean we couldn't even make contact with anyone in the Northern Territories um, nobody there um, they might have sort of one person that works on things like air quality but also on water and waste they're not sort of specific air quality people whereas in Melbourne and New South Wales they may have one or two people that, that work on air quality um, <clears throat> so this is, this is part of the problem in that um, the South East has all the money, so we were trying to sort of, what can we do if we pull it all together? So I've shown that animation. Um, and at the moment, the Australian government is looking at um, altering its um, environmental air quality standards. Um, we just had a change of government, unfortunately. They've gone to a conservative climate, sort of denying... Um, I shouldn't say this, this is all being recorded. Um, <laughs> climate denying sort of a government, um, but they are looking at air quality, and, which is a, a good thing. But what we're hoping to push them towards is this exposure based um, uh, air quality standard where particulate matter has no um, safe threshold. Um, so we'd need to sort of work out some sort of way of, of putting on this, this exposure standard, looking at health um, in Australia. Um, so we set up this symposium and we invited every single atmospheric chemist that we could think of in Australia, and this is they. Um, there's not that many of us. Um, so <laughs> Robin Schofield's there, if anyone remembers Robin Schofield, um, and Claire Murphy from, from Wollongong. Um, but that's it. It's sort of There's 69 people there, and that is the um, extent of air quality expertise in Australia. Um, and the sorts of things we talked about when we pulled some money together is what are the current knowledge gaps in Australia, um, particularly with the sources and sinks of these uh, air pollution problems, how might they be addressed, the methodologies to conduct health studies. And also, interestingly enough, if you ask, say, the Western Australian um, EPA how they count uh, traffic emissions, it might be completely different to how New South Wales count their traffic emissions. So we need a standardised um, methodology to, to even do that. Um, tools to develop a robust exposure reduction framework um, and the mechanisms to develop this sort of national coordinated framework. We also, um, I went back to the UK to talk to the UK air quality expert group. We might try and set up some sort of advisory um, group to sort of advise the ministers in Australia because um, we don't have one of those either. Um, so you can see there's a lot of challenges. Um, and this is the um, state of what might be the national emission inventory, the, the anthropogenic emission inventory. Um, it's very coarse. Again, there's nothing going on in the middle. There's nothing going on at the top. Um, the most modern inventory is Sydney, which the latest one was 2008. Melbourne's is 2006. Um, the one for Adelaide and Perth has probably, you know, come out of the 1980s, 1970s, um, and, and then there's Brisbane as well. So, really, we, we need to sort of kickstart this um, and get it going. And what we aim to do is have this whole process to policy system, a modelling system going on where. We go right from the emissions at the top there to our chemical transport modelling and, and some land use regression, which helps us um, look at the very, very high resolution, um, sort of almost road scale um, modelling. Um, we have very, very few air quality monitoring stations in Australia, but those we do have, we're going to try and sort of blend in with the, the modelled data to try and get some sort of optimal concentrations. And then move through into this, this health exposure um, studies to get health effects so we need to do exposure modelling we need risk factors from the epidemiologists and then this can all feed back you know, into the cost benefit into, into the emission inventory again and just the last slide on this now is um, we asked the jurisdictions from each of the states you know, what their main problems were and a lot of it is fire and dust and um, we have big problems um, with wood heaters um, one of our other problems is as you know Australia 
burns in summer. Um, so there is a remit in particularly Victoria and New South Wales that they must burn 5% of their air of the whole land mass to try and prevent the massive wildfires from going through. But of course this really annoys the locals as well because there's smoke in the air shed. Um, and then just other things that all of us consider, you know, should we go from PM 2.5 to the ultra fines? Can we measure that? Um, source apportionment, secondary particles. So you can see that there's a lot of challenges um, in Australia and I'm sort of at the moment a bit of a one woman band trying to um, sort it all out but... Um, if anyone wants to help, come and uh, come and speak to me. So, fun with Megan. Um, so, a couple of years ago, Louisa and Christine came down to uh, Aspendale, and I had a chat with uh, with Louisa, and she said to me, uh, "We've got this new version of Megan. Why don't you try and sort of put that into the into the Australian global model?" And I said, "Well, I, I don't really work on that, but I might uh, might try and put it into our our regional chemical transport model." Um, so this sort of started a, a bit of a well a bit of a, a fun hobby project for me um, so I mean I guess I'm preaching to a converted audience already but the importance of biogenic VOCs are that they um, they are huge um, sources of organic aerosol worldwide um, Potentially about sort of 87% globally of all secondary organic aerosol comes from biogenic sources. And then through the, the process um, on, the, on the screen there, you can go from gas phase substances um, through oxidation, you can make secondary organic aerosol. Now the interesting thing about Australia is that we have a lot of eucalypts, and eucalypts are different from other sort of trees and plants in that they are huge isoprene emitters. Um, and we have a lot in the, the southeast, as I said. Um, in fact, in Alex Gunther's paper of uh, 2006, he actually pointed out that Australia was a, a global hotspot of isoprene emissions. So we're, we're this little bit down here. Um, you can see from the scale there that it goes all the way up to sort of 16 micrograms per metre squared per hour as an emission factor. And if you look sort of globally there, there's a real sort of red spot around Sydney. Now we have some blue mountains down there and they are blue for this very reason. You can create a lot of ozone from the um, from the isoprene. Um, and this is just a, a blown up bit of Sydney. Um, Sydney's um, quite interesting. It's got this sort of funny T-shaped bit where all the, the population live. So sort of watch out for that later in the in the maps that I'm going to show. But yeah, these are the blue mountains around here. So the airshed of Sydney does have a lot of biogenics in it. CSIRO ran a particle um, campaign just west of the, the Sydney um, CBD. Um, and out of all of the particle concentrations that we measured, about 34% was all organic. And of that 34%, around 55% was secondary and biogenic in origin. So we've measured this as well as um, just speculating that there's a lot of biogenics in the air. Um, so the others are primary organic and secondary anthropogenic from things like um, cars and industry. Um, so there was need for a model. Now, we do actually run um, a very simplified um, version of um, a biogenic scheme in our chemical transport model. Um, I'll show you sort of what it does in a minute. Um, but this is how Megan works. So this is um, Alex's 2012 paper where you, well, I mean, you know all this, it came from NCAR. <laughs> um, so you take in a leaf area index. Um, it also takes in things like plant functional types. You can also provide it with emission factors. Um, you've got a sort of complex um, emission response algorithm. And just to sort of show you um, what our very simplified model does, this is, this is it. So it knocks out all of the sort of CO2 effects we have a very sort of simple canopy environment and um, light and temperature algorithms that were based on the sort of Gunther 95 um, paper. So if you just toggle between the, the two, you can see what, what gets knocked out. So what I'm trying to do here then is, is compare the two. Um, and obviously the, the in-house model has been tuned with a few measurements that were made in Australia, but again, most of them are in Sydney. There was one um, campaign done in Perth, but that was a while ago. I haven't got those uh, measurements. 
Um, so again, it's sort of coastal, coastal measurements. Um, so this is our, the CSIRO chemical transport model. It's sort of been built in-house over about 20 years by uh, Martin Cope and, more latterly, myself. Um, it has offline uh, meteorology, which we run from a stretched cubic conformal atmospheric model, which is that picture there on the over there. Can't tell my left from my right. Um, so that provides the meteorology. We provide it every single hour to the model. Um, it has various Australian emissions. We have the anthropogenic inventory that we sort of put together. As I said, most of our work's in Sydney, so that's the most recent one. Fire emissions that we, uh, we run from fire scar areas and the plume height, plume rise. Um, we have all the, the sort of other water vegetation emissions as well. It goes into the chemical transport model. We also have a, a capacity for doing size resolved aerosol from the GLOMAP, Global Model of Atmospheric Processes, which is a LEEDS model, which we can bolt onto the side. And, but this is basically a bulk aerosol model, and it will model the various aerosol um, mentioned over there. What we also do is downscale. So we nest the, the model, um, a bit like sort of how wharf chem works. Um, we will take global boundary conditions, provide them to an Australia-wide grid, which is done at about 81 kilometres resolution. Within that, we will nest. We go down by factors of three. So we will nest, I don't know it says 18, but generally it's 27K, 9K, 3K, and then if necessary, we will also go to 1K, um, which is particularly useful if you do have you know, um, coastal areas. Um, Wollongong, which um, Rebecca did her PhD at. We've also got some measurements there. This has a, a steep escarpment which goes down to the beach and sometimes it's useful to try and resolve you know, I mean I know one kilometre is probably not going to do it either but you know, we can talk about that later. So what I tried to do first thing, because this was my sort of first go at coupling up some models, was to take I lifted Megan basically out of Wharf uh, you know, the Wharf Chem CLM version and then reattached it to our cubic conformal atmospheric uh, model which provided it with the the PAR with all its um, temperature and uh, humidity needs. So I just ran it for 24 hours just to, to plot this sort of emission map. Um, so this is just um, at 80 kilometres, this is isoprene in molecules per second at one o'clock on February the 15th. So February is summer. I know it's a little bit different because we're upside down. Um, so, yeah, tested offline. I was, I was pretty happy with that. I mean, I'd got it to do something. Um, Jenny Fisher, very graciously, she's also at Wollongong, but used to be a, a Harvard um, geoschem modeler, also ran geoschem for the same day on February the 15th, I think it was, 2011. Um, and her plot of a 24 hour average is on the right, mine's on the left. Um, and at first, you know, I thought, ooh, you know, this, this looks a bit different. Um, my maximum goes up to 105 micromoles. Jenny's goes up to sort of 20 micromoles. And Alex said to us, well, why don't you try adding them up? And I, this hadn't occurred to me. Um, and when we did that, um, I ended up, we ended up with about a 10% difference, which we thought wasn't bad. And you can also see there, there is sort of, you know, there are differences. We are using very different sort of uh, plant functional type maps and other information. Um, but generally, I was pretty happy that, um, that this was working um, and that I could move forward and try and get Megan going online. Um, yeah. Now, why am I trying to do this when we've got an in-house scheme? Um, it's basically we're trying to sort of future-proof um, the model. Our current biogenic scheme will only output a bulk monoterpene emission. It will only output isoprene. So Megan potentially can give you 150 different compounds, um, provided you have the, the, the emission factors for them. Um, and as I said, I've got some PTRMS data from the Sydney Particle Study of I quite like the PTRMS because it lumps um, compounds together. Monoterpenes will all come out at 137 uh, mass. Actually, I can't remember what the units are. M, M over S, I think it is. 
Um, although I have since been told that furans also come out at 137, um, but more about that later. So one of the problems I ran into was, was resolution. So on the top I've got the emission factor map. This is um, for isoprene, and as I said, we go from 80 kilometres you know, down to 3 kilometres. So you could downscale the emission factor map. You know, it, it looks fine. And again, this is this T shape. I was on this, it's on its side. Um, of Sydney. But the plant functional type map that I uh, stole from um, the, what was it, the, the data repository um, at NCAR was at a half a degree resolution. Um, so just an example, this is the broadleaf evergreen temperate trees, so most of them are down the sort of the southeast coast of Australia, but when you, you try and downscale that to three kilometres, what you end up with is around five or six boxes um, which then you know really sort of mess up your one kilometer um, run because even if you superimpose this onto this it still ends up quite blocky um, so what I tried to do was try and find another way of doing the plant functional types in Australia and this is where I've really run into problems um, and I've been talking to Christine about this um, so this is the the International Global Biosphere Project um, map. Um, you can get this globally. It's at one kilometre resolution. Um, and as you can see, you have 17 different plant functional, well, land cover types, sorry. And what I needed to do was try and convert these into the NCAR plant functional types, of which there are 16, and you need to work out what's a broadleaf tree, what's needle leaf, what's a shrub, um, and what, what's grass as well. So I... Um, took some advice from a paper that was done here a while back, oh I can't remember when it was actually um, Bonin et al, I think it was about in the 90s sometime um, where they had pretty much done a similar thing um, to try and convert into these 16 plant functional types um, and I also took some advice from somebody also at CSIRO who had tried to do the same thing um, one of the ideas was, because um, you're basically trying to chop it up into tropical, temperate and, and boreal. We don't have any boreal in Australia, but you could do that by latitude, but you end up with you know, very, very hard lines in your, in your PFTs. Um, so the one thing that we tried was to take an, a seasonal average minimum temperature for, uh, for Australia and, and basically chop it up into, you know, if your minimum temperature was sort of less than... 15, then you know you were probably temperate, and if it was more than 15, you were going to be tropical. Um, so we did it that way. And what I ended up with in Sydney, for just as an example here, at one kilometre, um, no, sorry, that's three kilometres, um, is this sort of picture. And now again, we've got this funny T shape, but this here is the urban spot, so it's missing, um, which possibly isn't too good. Um, and I also um, ended up putting in a little bit of bare ground, um, as the bone-in paper suggested as well. Um, generally, it's not perfect, but I'm going to go with it. So just to look at some average spatial plots from the two field campaigns that we did in Sydney. So one is summer, February 2011, and the other one was heading towards you know, late autumn, winter, um, April, May of 2012. So this is isoprene, it's on the same scale so that you can see the difference. Um, so over here we've got the sort of blue mountains. Right over in the corner there is where the orography gets, um, gets quite high, so the temperatures are lower um, and so you don't get the isoprene emissions that you'd expect, say, from the blue mountains. But I was pretty happy with that. Um, and again, in, in late autumn, um, it's very, very much less. Um, so this is now for monoterpenes. The scale now is at 1.3 parts per billion, um, and you do get more of the monoterpenes, which um, which still prevail in winter. They don't have the same um, sort of emission patterns as, as isoprene. And then I also have plotted methanol, which looks like this. Again, very similar. I've got the the contours of the heights sorry, um, plotted on here as well, which sort of really helps you see where the the isoprene is constrained, where where you've got um, higher um, surface area, but you've also got this um, this rather alarming massive spot of methanol that um, appears just just to the southwest of the, the CBD, um, and this actually is a big factory. Um, this is an emission map of methanol, and sure enough, there it 
there it is. So I'm not quite sure what this factory does. It's um, maybe sort of paint or, or something like that. But yeah, it emits an awful lot of methanol. So as a time series, and I'm not going to show you loads of time series because they're boring. And also I decided because it was biogenic, I would plot it in green and that with hindsight was a mistake. Um, so <laughs> what we've got here is 2012. Um, just because there was more measurements, you know, obviously you go in summer expecting to get loads of measurements and then your PGRMS breaks down. So the PGRMS is in black, this is isoprene. So it peaks, peaks up here at around sort of four and a half, five parts per billion of isoprene. The original CSIRO model is in this sort of turquoise um, colour and it seems to do a fairly good job. My um, first sort of go with Megan is the, the green line. Um, and as you can see, it sort of, well, it disappears off the top, and more about that later. Um, I get a lot. So I also try to run with the original PFTs, um, you know, the big sort of half a degree resolution, which is down here in this dotted line, and it, it flatlines almost. So I do need to do something about the plant functional types. So that's what that told me. So as I said, I'm not going to show you loads and loads of these um, time series for all different species because they're terribly boring. What I am going to show is some of these um, quantile quantile plots. Um, now these are where you, you pair up the data um, by time, and then you just simply rank it, you know, between um, low to high, and it, it sort of tells you where you're starting to diverge. So you plot the observations on the x-axis and the models on the y-axis, um, and this is the one-to-one -one line. So for isoprene. Um, as you saw from the time series, I start to take off um, and I'm peaking there at about sort of 12 parts per billion, which is not, not so bad. But the original model, again, you know, quite simple based on um, local observations, I suppose, is actually doing a lot better. Um, and I need to spend some time working out why that would be. But I'm calling this the Goldilocks effect. So I get far, far too much isoprene. I don't get enough of the monoterpenes, and you can see the original scheme doesn't either. Um, the one-to-one -one line, you know, is well up here, so you know, it should be sort of peaking out at about two parts per billion, and I'm only getting around sort of 0.6 to 0.8 as a maximum. So not enough monoterpenes, but they get the methanol about right. Um, so again, Megan's in green, the original's in blue there. Um, the observations bottom out at 0.6 of a parts per billion, whereas the model doesn't um, doesn't agree with that. So, but yeah, so it's a bit strange. Um, at Wollongong, we um, also did a study. This is the measurement of urban and marine biogenic aerosols. As I said this is on the coast, just south of Sydney, um, and this was of interest because we also had a PhD student from France who was running the Shimmer model. Um, and Rebecca might be able to tell me which university she was at because I can't remember. You can't. No, I'm not sure. No. So she, her name was Geraldine uh, Rea, um, and she ran Shimmer. So again, we've got the PTRMS in black. Um, so this now runs from December 2012 into February 2013. So again, this is peak summer conditions for Australia. Um, and the original CSIRO model there is in blue. So why are the Megan models not there? Well, if you look there, the peak there is about four to five parts per billion. And this is what happens when you put the two Megan, um, or the models with Megan in. So shimmer are these blue dots here. Um, Geraldine was getting peaks of about 20. I was getting peaks of around 60 to 70 parts per billion of, of isoprene. Um, so you see the pair of us were, were doing you know, very much worse than the original model. Um, so again, this is what the quantile quantile plots look like for isoprene. Um, again, observations down here, and this is the one-to-one -one line. Um, and both Shimmer, which is here, and Megan um, do pretty badly. But they both sort of seem to take off, you know, and, and start to go in the wrong direction at the same time, um, which again is quite interesting. Um, and we need to sort of look at why that is. I did ask Geraldine what plant functional type she was using, but unfortunately she couldn't tell me. Um, but again, too much isoprene. This is the monoterpenes. Um, again, so Megan there, or my Megan, sorry, is in, in the green, so I'm not getting enough. 
although interestingly shimmer is, is picking up really quite well at the very low um, observational um, concentrations but then tends to diverge but then methanol um, unfortunately which Geraldine didn't give me any results for is about right particularly at the um, at the upper concentration so the trouble with with what I can do now is based on this is one of Alex's tables from this 2012 paper where you look at the the emission factors for different plant functional types and you can see you know you get, you get sort of peaks of about 11,000 but also if you try to sort of mess around with the emission factors just for isoprene to bring them down a bit but you know you'd also be bringing down the monoterpenes as well I need to find a way of sort of pushing down the isoprene bringing up the monoterpenes but without messing messing up my methanol um, concentrations if I had measurements of other compounds I could look at look at doing that um, but yeah I need some some ideas um, it could be down to the vegetation uh, mapping um, but it's, it's sort of interesting that perhaps, you know, if we run this globally, that the results are sort of consistent between Shimmer and uh, my version of Megan and um, Geos Chem as well, where, you know, you could get the same amount roughly, even though the, the spatially it might be a bit different. You get the same amount from, from Australia. Um, and, you know, why does the in-house scheme sort of do fairly well for isoprene? I mean, again, the, the land surface type for Australia that that scheme uses is completely different, and I could look at ways of trying to sort of put those into the 16 plant functional types um, for Megan. So there's lots of things to do, but I would really appreciate some, some ideas from here as to how we can improve it. Um, so just lastly, I've... I've, been, I've started a Twitter account about three weeks ago, so I've, Lord knows what I'm doing with it, but if you want to follow me in my one-woman mission to sort of kick Australia into the 21st century with air quality, I'm at Emerson Catherine, and uh, you can see how I, how I do. But thank you for listening. Um, those are my details. Um, come and talk to me. I'm here until Friday. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. I just had a question about the emission factors that they have in Megan mm. are, you know, applied to evergreen tropical forests globally. And yep. are there any specific emission factors that we could use for Australian forests? I know Alex and Andrew and Jim all went down there mm. to Timbarumba and took measurements. And so yeah. could we take advantage of that or where we know the eucalypts are, we could put in emission factors specific to yeah. that. Well, I wondered actually whether Alex had included those as part of his global... Well, I can ask him later, but, um, yeah, because I, I was only told sort of quite recently that he had been in Australia, so I don't have those measurements. We do have some other sort of flux measurements that... Um, Paul, uh, Paul Palmer's group is down there too, doing flux measurements in the tropical forest, yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah, we did some in-house ones a few years ago, you know, where we sort of stuck a box over some grass, but... Um, yeah, they are. The measurements are very few and far between. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we need to start collating stuff. And I'll speak to Alex later. And then with your observations um, that you're comparing on your QQ plots, are the majority of those observations in urban areas, or are they in it's, more natural environments? Well, the Wollongong measurements were on the coast, so I mean, there there wasn't that much sort of interference from the from the urban area. Within Sydney, the the observations were Western Sydney, so yes. Um, you know, particularly when you get the sea breeze, it would probably cut across Sydney and then um, hit the, the observational site. But, um, yeah, you've got to take the measurements with a pinch of salt, but they are pretty much the only measurements we've got, so, yeah. Sorry, if no Go ahead, there. yeah. I, just, I mean, dust is such a huge issue there, too. What do you guys uh, include for a dust model? Or how do you include um, dust? Again, this is not sort of my area, but we do have... It's based on soil moisture, so... Um, uh, and wind speed. Um, but I think it's one of the... I couldn't tell you, like, whose scheme it was, but, yeah, it's a scheme that somebody's in, in the literature. 
I think Alex will tell us that there are also differences between within one PFT. Mm. Different regions have different emission factors, mm. and so the PFT is sort of a it's a pretty coarse way of yeah. specifying things. But it was a simplest simple way for allowing a, f- a climate model to yeah. to calculate something for the future, whereas a a static mm. map by region may not. Um, yeah, you can't make it change for a future land cover so that could be mm. an effect here for all three of those species methanol yeah terpenes and ice cream yeah in the model results what drives the really large increases in in concentration is that source region like pft source or temperature um, or meteorology it's i haven't fig- i haven't nailed it down completely i think it's pop- it's meteorology um primarily um either you've got um you know the the boundary layer has collapsed perhaps more than it should have done so you've got a sort of you know fumigation if you like of, of isoprene um, and other stuff and and given that we use um, you know I'm getting similar although not quite as high results in, in shimmer I think it's um, it's a it's a it's a what's the word a boundary layer collapse type event or you know you're, you're sitting over an area of really really high emissions for for too long but but then again, you'd see the same from the monotherapines. I haven't figured it out entirely yet. Um, my main job was, you know, trying to get the thing to, to run. But <laughs> um, as I said, it was a hobby project. But um, yeah, I need to sort of go into, um, you know, ratios of, of isoprene to uh, the isoprene products. I need to go into, you know, what happens to OH. Because obviously, if I've got sort of 60 parts per billion of isoprene hanging about, that's really going to mess up my... Uh, my OH and then the chemistry of the rest of the air shed. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Just just thinking. Uh, I'm not an expert in this at all. But um, methanol and terpenes are the emission are dependent basically on temperature, right? Mm. Whereas isoprene is also is temperature and right. radiation dependent. Yeah. Is there something maybe missing or something we don't understand about the radiation mm. component of the isoprene emission factor for those types of plants or you know something along that line of thinking? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's down to the light and the temperature. I think it is primarily down to, and perhaps I should have said this earlier, um, so if you look at this um, this table in Alex's um, paper, as I said, the maximum he's got here is about 10,000 or 11,000. And if you look at the map of emission factors for Australia, it peaks at about 22,000. So I think it's sort of been artificially elevated to account for, you know, sort of eucalypts in general. And I'm wondering whether actually it's gone a bit too far and it needs to come down a bit. Um, but again, we'd need to, to do more measurements on that. And I think... My next um, iteration of this is to start playing with those emission factor maps as well, and you know, chop them down a bit and see what see what happens. Um, but yeah, I think that's more of a problem than the the light and temperature process um, parameterization. What's the likely distribution of sources of formaldehyde? The reason I'm asking is because it seems like you you would have two two different situations. One in which you're very you're not influenced at all by isoprene, in which case the formaldehyde is mostly from I'm guessing methane steady state. So really quite yeah. easy to predict. Mm. And the other situation in which you have lots of isoprene and the formaldehyde is coming from the isoprene. Mm. If those two situations can be separated out, I wonder if satellite measurements of formaldehyde might help to mm. inform the emissions of isoprene. Yeah, and actually Jenny Fisher is starting a, a PhD student off on uh, uh, formaldehyde-based sort of isoprene um, emissions for Australia. Um, but again, I think they've only just started, but yeah, I think that's a good idea. 
because we do have formaldehyde measurements as part of these campaigns. So we can look at that. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks uh, for coming. We have turns around for the rest of the week. Um, sitting on the first floor, if anyone wants to stop by and chat. <laughs>